Good morning, everybody. So good to see so many people here this morning. All righty. As the kids are go ahead and sing their way out, if y'all want to turn your Bibles to Nehemiah, all of our scriptures are going to be out of Nehemiah 1 and 2. Is this good? Sound good? Okay, good. All righty. This week was a pretty colorful week in our reading, if you ask me. So we got like parts of Ezra, we got the whole book of Nehemiah, we got some Esther. We got a lot of stuff to pull from here. So this morning we're going to be looking specifically in the book of Nehemiah. So if y'all want to follow along your Bibles, I'm going to read Nehemiah 2, verses 16 through 20. All right, so starting in verse 16. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, for I had not yet told the Jews, priests, nobles, officials, or the rest of those who would be doing the work. So I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned down. Come, let's rebuild Jerusalem's wall so that we will no longer be a disgrace. And I told them how the gracious hand of my God had been on me and, with, and, and what the king had said to me. They said, let's start rebuilding, and they were encouraged to do this good work. When Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about this, they mocked and despised us and said, what is this you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? I gave them this reply. The God of heaven is the one who will grant us success. We, his servants, will start building, but you have no share, right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. So when Pastor Mark asked me to preach this week, I think he was feeling pretty generous because he gave me a lot to pull from. There was a lot of different books I could go into to find something to read out of, to preach out of, but he recommended the book of Nehemiah because there is a lot of good stuff in there, or he said so at least. I remember talking about that. I remember thinking when he said that, I don't know if it's the same for you guys, but every single sermon, every teaching, every Bible study, anything that has to do with the book of Nehemiah has been about leadership. Every single one that I've ever been a part of. And I remember thinking to myself, if I choose to do Nehemiah, I'm not going to talk about leadership. That's not something I'm going to do. I'm going to pick something else. I'm going to find something that people don't talk about. I'm going to find something new to preach about. Well, here we are, talking about leadership. I couldn't get away from it. I tried. I really, really did. But God is very persuasive. In all of my circles, my personal um, readings in my master's class, uh, reading through our, our weekly reading, Everything's been leadership. Everything's coming up leadership over and over and over. And as I'm getting, as I was reading through Nehemiah, just not even through the first chapter, and leadership qualities are just like flying into my face off the page. So I couldn't get away from it. God convinced me to go through this. And since it's coming up in all of my circles, preparing this sermon was as much for my benefit as I hope it will be for your benefit as well. Before we get started with this, I want to take a step back and take a look at where Nehemiah sits in the biblical timeline. Because I think it's easier to understand a biblical story when I can see where it fits into the narrative. And Ryan did a good job giving us a little summary of stuff that comes right before Nehemiah. Going back and taking a look at the books of Kings and Chronicles, though, we do get a look at Israel's history, right? We get to see um, what happened after the passing of King David. So the nation has split. There's two nations, the northern and the southern kingdom. We've got Israel and we've got Judah. In Kings specifically, we get a look at the state of the, the, the two nations and their kings. Israel's kings, for the most part, not so great. Not a single one of them was doing super well. And in Judah, really only a handful of the kings were worthy of note and did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And then in Chronicles, we get another look, this time focusing specifically on Judah, highlighting more of their better kings, uh, showing a little bit more of their good deeds in it. But both books have basically the same conclusion. The people's sin had gone on long enough, and God brings judgment. He allows them to be conquered. They're taken into exile in Babylon, and this is where we find ourselves now, catching up to where we are. So some time has passed. Babylon itself had been conquered by Persia. There's a new king in place, and this is where you find Nehemiah, a Jew in exile, no longer a slave, a, a cupbearer to the king, but still in exile, away from his home. Gone are the days of Israel's military might. Gone are the days of the great celebrations in the temple. Gone are the days of even God's presence filling the temple. This is the setting that we find leadership qualities, godly leadership qualities. So let's go ahead and take a look. Our first point this morning I want to talk about. Godly leaders pray. Godly leaders pray. Well, I mean, of course they do, right? You, you would hope so. Everybody should pray. It's a spiritual discipline that everybody should be taking part of as Christians. But as Christians, we're also called to be leaders. We're leaders in our families. 
We're leaders in our churches. We're leaders in different ministries. We're leaders in the community. And whether or not you actually find yourself in some sort of leadership position, all of us are called to lead others to Christ, to lead people to God. So not just praying as followers of God, we're also called to pray as leaders to God. Let's take a look at Nehemiah's prayer life. We get a little snapshot of it in Nehemiah 1, verses 4 through 6. I'll go ahead and read that right now. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, Yahweh, the God of heaven, the great and awe-inspiring God, who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands, let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer that I now pray to you day and night for your servants, the Israelites. I confess the sins we have committed against you. Both I and my father's house have sinned. So what prompted this prayer, like Ryan pointed out, was some news that he had heard. Someone was traveling from Judah, and he asks them, he takes this opportunity to find out what the state of Judah is. And he tells them, Judah and the people in Judah were in a disgraceful situation. Jerusalem's walls were in ruins, its gates were torn down. Beyond the fact that the walls and the gates were a mode of protection for the people, you could imagine that Nehemiah's shock upon hearing this. This is Jerusalem. This is the city of King David. This is the seat of the temple. And surely, having the walls and ruins didn't do anything for the Israelites' image, not of themselves or their image to other people, the neighboring people around them. They weren't really representing themselves very well with the state that things were in. And in our reading, we see what Nehemiah's reaction to this news is. Weeping, mourning, fasting, and prayer. That's a very powerful and emotional reaction. And there's a few things I want to talk about that come from his prayer. So in the face of news that obviously grieves Nehemiah, he starts his prayer not by complaining, not by giving in to any sort of doubt, but instead he remembers God. And he remembers specifically God's faithfulness. He starts, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant. Jerusalem's walls at this time probably did not reflect this awe-inspiring God that Nehemiah knows. But he remained faithful. He remained faithful to his understanding of God's character. He didn't give in to hopelessness and start his prayer with, Oh, woe is me, God. Why would you do this to us? No. He started off remembering God's sovereignty in the situation. And something else I noticed out of his prayer is that he also recognized his and the people's role in the situation. He recognized they weren't perfect. They weren't holding up their end of the covenant. He confesses his sin. He also confesses their sin. He states, we've not been faithful to God's commands. That's a powerful prayer. That's a powerful way to start a prayer, especially one that you're going to preach day and night. It makes me think about um, a time when I received some bad news. So this would have been several years ago. Cody was a baby Christian. He had just come uh, to know the Lord, I think, maybe a semester before this. So I was in college. I was going to Texas A&M University in Kingsville. I was going to the school for mechanical engineering. Obviously, it's been a while. I can't even remember. Um, You can tell that didn't pan out. I'm not up here talking about math and science. I'm talking about here about God. So my plan didn't pan out. But I remember I got some news. I was failing some of my classes. I was actually failing all of my classes at that time. It was pretty bad news. And it was shocking news for a lot of people in my life because I was a pretty good student in high school. I did really well. Just the semester before that, all A's, high B's, doing really well for myself. But the core of the problem at the time was I had allowed myself to get into a rut. I had allowed myself to fall into some bad habits. Um, I had let hopelessness, despair, and doubt take root in my life. And when I heard the news, A little bit like Nehemiah, I recognized my role in the situation. But that's where the similarities end. I remember thinking to myself, like, no, yeah, that makes sense. I deserve those grades for the amount of work that I put into it. And that was it. I don't remember praying. I don't remember weeping. I don't remember mourning. I know I didn't fast. I was eating a lot at that time. I really put on that freshman 15 really quickly. But I didn't pray. Little baby Christian Cody wasn't strong enough in his faith at that time to reach out to God. But here we see the strength in Nehemiah's life. Of course, I've since grown past that failure. I've grown past my less than stellar response to it. I had Christians around me, Christian fellowship to build me up, to support me that I could rely on. Uh, Other leaders in my life that were praying for me that I could take advantage, not take advantage of, take um, heart by looking up to them. And we see in Nehemiah's life, he was that kind of leader. 
Looking back at his prayer, we see his reverence for God. We see his recognition of his role in the matter. And at the end of the prayer that we see here, he asked God to grant him success in what it was that he planned to do. And that's our second point this morning. Godly leaders plan. Now you may have heard the old quote, if you want to make God laugh, tell him about your plans. If you have heard that, I hope you didn't just say, well, I'm just never gonna plan anything. I'll just let God take care of everything because that's not a responsible way to respond to that. And while our plans don't often pan out the way we hope so, taking a look at uh, my plan to become a mechanical, en and mechanical engineer, for example, remember, God's plans do go through. God himself is a planner. Think about some of the things we've been reading about this year in the Old Testament. Before the flood, God gave Noah plans to build the ark. On Mount Sinai, God gave Moses plans for the tabernacle. He even gave them plans specifically on how they were supposed to interact with one another, how they were supposed to seek ritual cleanliness, how they were supposed to um, react even with the people around them, social justice instructions and plans and whatnot. When David was king, God gave him plans for the temple that he would eventually allow his son to build Solomon. Our God makes plans. And as reflections of him, we also reflect those character qualities. We also make plans. We're exercising what God has already put in us, made in his image. Let's look at the kind of planning that Nehemiah did. We can take a look at some small part of his plan in Nehemiah 2. I'm going to read verses 6 through 8. So, the king with the queen seated beside him asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you return? So I gave him a definite time and it pleased the king to send me. I also said to the king, if it pleases the king, let me have letters written to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates River so that they will grant me safe passage until I reach Judah. And let me have a letter written to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so he will give me timber so I can rebuild the gates of the temple's fortress, the city wall, and the home where I will live. The king granted my requests, for I was graciously strengthened by my God. Nehemiah hasn't thrown together this plan like, go to city, build walls, go home. That's maybe something I might have planned in the past, uh, if you can tell I wasn't much of a planner at that time. But Nehemiah had a much better plan. It was a lot more detailed. He'd already thought about how long this process was going to take. He gave the king a definite time he would be back. He thought about some of the obstacles along the journey, how he would get safe passage, where he would get materials. He even thought about, where am I going to live at this time? I need to be able to build myself a house to stay in while I'm going through this building project. Now, if you guys have ever been part of a building project, if you've ever had renovations done on a home, if you've ever had to build a building of some sorts, you know that it can be frustrating trying to get straight answers from some of the people doing the work. Anna and I have been working on this idea of perhaps renovating the home that I grew up in. So we've talked to a lot of different people, some contractors, some builders, people working in carpentry, uh, construction, that kind of stuff. And you can tell. Some of those people we talk to are great leaders. They're definitely planners. I can tell that their interactions with the people they know, the way that they give us the answers when we ask them, the way that they make suggestions, and we don't even know what questions we're supposed to be asking. These people have made a plan. They know what they're doing. Other people, less so. And perhaps that's my fault, if I'm being honest. Maybe Anna and I shouldn't be thinking about making renovations while the prices for construction buildings are fluctuating mostly upwards for the most part there. Um, and I understand it's really difficult to get answers during these hard times. But Nehemiah wasn't trying to please Cody King. He was trying to please the king of Persia. Answers like that would not have been good for him. I don't know. You know, the market right now is really unstable, or it'll take as long as it takes. Those kinds of things wouldn't have pleased the king of Persia. And we see Nehemiah's responses did please him. They pleased the king so much that the king even gave him an armed guard, something Nehemiah didn't even ask for. He said, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. Let me help him out here. Let me make sure he gets his stuff done. Nehemiah went in with a plan. He was able to answer the questions for the king. He was able to make suggestions for him, for some of the stuff that wasn't covered in the conversation. Now, I hope that you don't hear this and just think, well, if I plan things well enough, everything will go well. I can plan God right out of my life, because that's not what I'm trying to tell you to do. Remember, before Nehemiah went in with that plan, he prayed. He aligned himself with God through that prayer. And the Bible tells us that his requests were granted because he was graciously strengthened by God. Planning is good. And we need to recognize, though, God's role in our planning. We can't do prayer without planning. We can't do planning without prayer as leaders. Being the God who plans 
We're only exercising what he's given us when we make plans ourselves. We need to align ourselves with God's plan first through prayer and then let God graciously strengthen us through our planning. After praying and after planning, we see one more thing that in Nehemiah's life, one other leadership quality. So our third point this morning is godly leaders persevere. Oops. So Nehemiah immediately sets out for the task at hand. He receives that armed escort. He goes about, he collects his building supplies. It doesn't say anything about him actually building his house just yet. But even then, his planning isn't done. Not really. After he gets to Jerusalem, he takes a look around the walls to see the state that they're in, kind of surveying the area. And he gives this motivational speech that we read about earlier to the people, encouraging them to get started with the good work of building. But not everything's going perfectly. Even being aligned with God's plan. Even having a good plan thought out ahead of time. Nehemiah encounters something that the Bible doesn't say he was necessarily prepared for, at least you're not recorded in the Bible. He encounters opposition from the people living in the area. And we read about this, we already read it once, but I'm gonna go over it one more time. Nehemiah 2, verses 18 through 20. It says, I told them how the gracious hand of my God had been on me and what the king had said to me, and talking to the people doing the work. And they said, let's start rebuilding, and they were encouraged to do this good work. When Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about this, they mocked and despised this and said, what is this you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? I gave them this reply. The God of heaven is the one who will grant us success. We as servants will start building, but you have no share, right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. Now this is just the first interaction between, that we see between Nehemiah and these people here. These people would come up again and again and again, doing everything they could to mess up this building project that Nehemiah was working on. Some of those things are recorded here in Nehemiah, and we can take a look at how he responds to them. He faces slander, he faces deception, he faces betrayal, threats against his own life. Even the workers are afraid for their lives at this moment. And I remember one of the instances kind of made me laugh as I was reading this, because it seemed really childish. So some of the opposers have all gotten together, and they're all just kind of slandering Nehemiah. I don't know if this is some kind of like team building exercise that the people of the play, time and place did, but they're all together, and they're all making fun of him and slandering him. And one of the men, Tobiah, says something that was pretty funny if you ask me. He says, if a fox climbed up what they were building, he would break down their stone wall. The only thing the Bible tells us about all the slander, oh, they were saying bad things. This is one of them. Like, they were exaggerated mocking in the group. It's good to see that that's been happening since Old Testament times. This isn't something we've invented. But Nehemiah faces this opposition, this exaggerated opposition even, from the outside, hopelessness even from the inside. In chapter 4, we read about some of the people that are doing the work, some people in Judah, and they say, the strength of the laborer fails. We'll never be able to rebuild the wall. Even the nobles and the officials of the land, people that live there, their own countrymen, were bleeding their own people dry by... Um, putting their children into slavery, charging them interest on debts, buying up their lands before the people so they had nowhere to live. He had his hands full. Building the wall aside, Nehemiah was busy. He had a lot to persevere. But what did he do during these hard times to hold fast? What did he do to persevere? Did he just grit his teeth and soldier on? Well, not quite. Every time opposition came up, Nehemiah would look to God. When they first opposed him, Nehemiah remembers God. The God of heaven is the one who will grant us success. When the enemies mocked him, Nehemiah cried out to God, Listen, our God, for we are despised. When the enemies planned against him, Nehemiah and the people prayed. When the people fell into despair, Nehemiah encouraged them, Remember the great and awe-inspiring Lord. When the nobles were taking advantage of their own people, Nehemiah rebuked them, Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God? It was all about God. Nehemiah held fast by holding fast to God. Despite the adversity, the city walls were eventually rebuilt. Nehemiah, along with some of the other leaders like Ezra, were able to start this spiritual renewal with the people. Because Nehemiah persevered, he prayed, he planned, and he persevered. I think for most people, it's fairly easy to do at least one of those. Some people may prefer to just pray and hope that God puts everything right. Some people might put trust in their own talents and skills and plan things and hope everything goes according to plan. And even others might just grin and bear it, try to persevere through everything. But the best outcome is when we do all three. We connect with God through prayer. We align ourselves with this plan. We reflect his quality when we ourselves plan. And then we persevere by holding fast to God. 
Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you so much for today. I want to thank you for bringing us together. I want to thank you for the seniors, God, and just the blessing it's been to have them in our lives, God. And I pray for them, for them to pray, for them to plan, for them to persevere. But I pray that for all of us, as leaders in our lives, in our families, in our communities, God. Give us the, the qualities that we need to lead well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, as we go into our invitation song, if there's anything you need to pray about, you, need, you would like to come up here and have one of us pray for you, I'd be happy to do that for you. Let's all go ahead and stand together as we sing.